Moana 2 is on the way and it's coming out with about one-fifth to one-tenth of the regular time spent on making an animated feature film. How is that possible to do this in six months? Well, we're about to find out. Or are we? Ladies and gentlemen, we're here to tell you that Disney may have a backup plan to back up Moana. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Pro Channel. It is, as ever, a pleasure that you are here. An attitude of gratitude we have for each and every one of our viewers. And that's you. You're the electricity that drives all this. You're the gigawatt. So, so thank you for accompanying us. And Lou Wasserman's ghost, LW Ghost, is also here today to talk about something interesting. Mr. Ghost, welcome back. Thank you. Always happy to be here and hope to be interesting. That's right. Well, the interesting thing we're going to discuss is that Disney seems to have a way to get out of this unbearable situation they've put themselves in with Moana 2. To give everybody a recap, we've talked about this in the past, but so many of you are new viewers and we're happy to have you. Uh, Moana 2 is being created. It was a TV show for Disney+, Plus, but it's being created whole cloth for movie, for, for cinemas, um, and that's something that usually takes three to five years. We would anticipate that this would be a musical. And musicals for Disney tend to take five years of planning and work and making and all of that. The gestation of the film, one might say, five years. Moana's going to try to do that. The studio in Vancouver that's in charge of it, of course. And they've never made a movie before. A lot of folks don't know that. Under a director who's never made a movie before. Although everybody I talk to says he's a very nice guy. but. They've got to do it in six months, which is just absolutely her, uh, Herculean in, in what they're going to have to do. I want to show everybody, though, uh, this is the thing. And, Mr. Ghost, you brought this to my attention. I want you to weigh in in just a moment. But let's let's give everybody sort of a, uh, a touchdown as to what this is. This is out of The Hollywood Reporter by Katie Kilkenny. And it says, I-A-T-S-E. But as you told me before the video, most people just call it I-A. I think it's fun to say, Yahtzee. <laughs> Studio set to negotiate craft specific issues. And folks, where it says next week, well, that's this week because this was from Friday. So this week, uh, the IA is going to sit down and try to figure this all out. Basically, folks, what's happening right now is the Teamsters and IATSE, they are uh, getting ready to potentially go on a strike in the fall. So here's what the article says, and then we'll we'll tell you how this connects with Moana. This is really fascinating stuff, and, and to my knowledge, nobody's talking about this. After nearly a week of internal conversations on both sides, Iyatsi and Hollywood's major studios and streamers will be resuming their ongoing negotiations on Monday, but Monday by covering craft-specific issues. Now, folks, if this feels like deja vu, well, like Yogi Berra, <laughs> it's all over again. Because, yes, we just did this all last year, but now... Uh, it's the Everybody Else Guild, right? It's not the Director's Guild. It's not the Writer's yeah, Guild. Yeah, we should give people the sort of basic lay of the land here. IATSE is all the other groups that make movies. That's everything from cameramen to craft service to editors to uh, grips and electricians and makeup and hair and all the rest of that. And that's why they're talking about craft-specific because there's some things that apply to everybody as far as hours and that sort of thing, but other things that apply specifically to different groups within it, and they have to handle it all. And it's looking more, not less likely, that they're going to go on strike, just as the others did last year. They're going to go on strike this year, potentially. Is that right, Mr. Ghost? Well, yes, no, and maybe. This is kind of a weird situation. First of all, let me explain that the contract expires uh, the end of July, so August First is the day that the strike would happen, if it happened. The pattern in the industry for the IA and for the Directors Guild and for the Writers Guild has been to do what we call early negotiations, which means get together in March, work it all out, limit the number of issues you're going to talk about because it is early, and in return, nobody gets stuck holding the bag, being in the middle of a production and having it shut down by a strike. That's the theory, Okay. Uh, theory sometimes leads to uh, disappointment when it doesn't happen. But the point is that in the past, if they were negotiating and they were getting close and it wasn't quite done and it, the deadline came and went, the unions would say, okay, we'll extend the current terms past the expiration date. And when we make a deal, we will obviously retroactively upgrade everybody on the things that we get. 
They have already announced very loudly and clearly, we ain't doing no extensions. We don't like this current contract because the last one barely got through. And they are saying well in advance, if you don't make a deal by the day, the next day we're gone, we're out of here. So that puts a lot of pressure, obviously, on everything because they know there's no there's no fudging, there's no hedging, there's no hanging over. It's all going to be done or not by then. Right. Yeah. And, and so there's something interesting about this. And, and let's connect it back to Moana 2 because there are a lot of folks out there who clicked on this and they want Moana 2 and they're sitting there saying, well, you know, what's up with this Yahtzee kind of thing or IA as we should pro <laughs> more properly say. Um, so let's put it this way. Of the films that are coming out in November of 2024, okay, we've got a Paddington movie, we've got a Gladiator sequel, uh, we've got a bunch of different films that are coming out um, in, in November. Well, not a bunch in comparison to other years, but, you know, there are some. And those films coming out in November, they're done. So if, if a strike happens, it really isn't going to affect the films that come out in November one would anticipate, except for... Mr. Ghost, and I credit you for bringing this to my attention, except for Moana 2. And the reason is because Moana has six months to be finished. And so if this strike happens, if this strike happens in, what is it, August or, or October? It, that it, can it would be October, or, or pardon me, you're right, August 1 would be the strike. So if that happens in August which would just be about, uh, what, five, six months from now, then Moana 2 could actually be impacted such that it cannot be released. Now, let's take a look at this, uh, this out of Yahoo News we have. and We really just want the Instagram image here. This is Ali'i Cravalho. She is the voice actress behind Moana. And not very long ago, as in about two weeks ago, she posted and said, the feeling when you're officially returning to Montanui. And that's that's the home island of Moana. What she's saying here is that she's back to play Moana. And the building behind her is the animation building on the Disney lot in Burbank, which is not officially where this movie is being made. It's being made right. in their new Vancouver. studio up in Vancouver. Boy, that's interesting. I'm glad you brought that out. I had not thought to make that connection to kind of laugh about yeah, it. If you are ever in LA and you're driving by on the uh, freeway, you'll see this building. And alongside the freeway near near everything else at Disney. You'll, you'll see a building vacant of anybody working on Moana too, apparently. <laughs> well, well, that's the official word. But you see, I, as I told you, I have a suspicion. When we heard this was going to be a musical, and musical numbers, I gave you in another talk, and if people haven't heard it, they should try this experiment. Go look at, um, well, the Be Our Guest sequence of, uh, of you know, uh, Beauty and the Beast. Beauty and the Beast, yeah. And just sit there with your hand and snap your fingers or click or make a mark on a piece of paper every time there's a cut. And now do it in an equal amount of time, whatever it is, three or four minutes, elsewhere in the movie without a musical number. And Please what folks, you will make find, sure that those watching with you know what you're doing. Otherwise, yeah, well, you know, you're going this is to the, assuming you're, you've got the tape and you can fast forward to the right spot and right. all that. Or tape. You don't want to so be sent to the shrink by your family members because but, they but don't the know what, what exactly you're up to. that musical numbers take a whole heck of a lot more work and time and effort to do. Now, when we heard the announcement, A, they're making it a movie, which we can talk about that whole Disney Plus budget versus feature budget thing. Uh, and B, they're making it in the new studio in Vancouver. Apparently, they hadn't told anybody in that building behind her there that that was going to happen. And they learned about it in the news. That's and great they point. were not too thrilled because they thought, hey, I thought we were the animation department of Walt Disney. And so they had a big meeting. And since then, we haven't heard a peep. Well, and I think... I think they told them, yeah, but you're going to do some too. And that they're going to split the labor between the two studios because maybe they'll let the more experienced people do the musical numbers. I don't know this for a fact. I'm just saying it's a possibility to get that very, very tight schedule done that I, they're basically using right. two studios. I think you're right. And I think, of course, that the actors are going to be recording their lines uh, there in the building. I don't oh. know for sure. but Oh, they uh, better be know. done by now. Well, okay, so that's <laughs> but that's a great point. And, okay. and they better be done by now. And when you realize that when they made the big announcement, when Big Bob made his let me step out of the shower and tell you the news announcement, they hadn't signed her. They hadn't signed The Rock. They hadn't even gotten them into the studio. And we don't even know what the script is and whether it'll change and all that. So, so what that means then is that recording for this film could not have begun until this month. 
Okay. Right. Now, right. if recording for this film could not begin until this month, then you have March, April, May, June, July, August, September. And that's about it. I mean, really, this film needs to be done by the end of September to, to prepare it for international release and for As you and pointed all out, it's got to be translated into all. Remember, we've seen these videos well, of like, yeah, the official princess song languages. and all the different women from all around the world singing the same song in their own language and all right, that. You've got to hire all of those different voice actors yeah. in all of those different languages. Yeah. It's, it's an and insane And, of course, task. the ad campaign and everything else has to be prepared. Right. And the, and the so, songs, don't forget the songs. Of the Ghost, that's another part of this. Okay. So yes. let's say they get in there and they, they're able to record the dialogue. One would assume that the songs, that they're not ready yet because they have to go to the composers. They have to go to, the, to uh, whoever's going to do the lyrics. And then they have to record their version for the, uh, for the voice talent, for the musicians to come in and listen to. And then to replicate that for the final and, version. Well, the, the the one leg up they do have, I have to say, with this guy who's the official director up in Vancouver is that the vast majority of his experience has been in storyboarding. And especially with a musical number, they could be doing that without the finished thing because they can say, well, we need a shot of this and a shot of this and a shot of this. And if you understand storyboarding, that's what comes first. So that could have been happening from the minute the... The gun went off, and it is possible that some sequences that were already storyboarded for the TV show could be used more or less intact in the feature. So they have that. So let's explain now. This, folks, thank you for hanging in there with us. We want to give you the best information we possibly can. Now let's get to that headline-making uh, title, which is that this thing could be delayed and that it may already be baked into the cake that they want this as an escape hatch. So well, 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 we have our two very interesting possibilities, none of which we can confirm, as you're always telling people, this is rumor and speculation, and a lot of speculation, frankly, from yours truly. So I'm out on the limb here, not you. But, but let's but say this, Mr. Ghost. <laughs> when you're connecting dots and the dots are so close that it takes about a, a, pin, a pin drop to connect them, uh, it's not too difficult, but go ahead. Go well, ahead. first of all, Understand that when the announcement was made about this, oh, we're suddenly making it a movie and we're doing it in Vancouver, they already knew that the IA had given this ultimatum saying, we're not extending, we're not overlapping, we're not contending. If it ain't done by August 1, we're gone. And they had to know that happens right in the middle of their production schedule they're about to announce. So the first thought that came to our minds was, what if they expect it to? And right. what if that will be their excuse for why it doesn't get out in time after all? It wasn't our fault. We were ready to go. But those dang unions. Right. <sighs> August 1st. Oh, darn it. Phooey. Shoot. Good heavens. We, re we really thought we were going to get this out in six months. But now we can't. We're so sorry. I, I think it's, the, uh, you know, it's a great escape hatch uh, for Disney to have on hand. Now, if, if the strike doesn't happen, you know, then which is which is Moana. part two of 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 my speculation, which is this Please Southern sir. California and not just the movie business, but everybody who, you know, everybody who's a writer, a director, a grip, anybody. They've also got a dry cleaner and they've also got a restaurant they go to and they've also got all these businesses have just been hit with a major, 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 major piece of pain by the previous strikes. They don't want them to go out again. I will also remind everyone, in case they hadn't noticed, because they've been asleep somewhere, this is an election year. And I will remind you that the party in power in California is the one that's running for re-election. And that they are running on, oh, well, the economy is going to get better. Honest it is. It is very likely to me that there will be some kind of behind-the-scenes meeting, if there hasn't been already, between the studio heads and Gavin Newsom and company, uh, maybe even going up to the White House, who knows, saying, guys, cut a deal, make a deal, make a deal, make a deal, make a deal, even if it costs you. After all, it's not your money, it's the stockholders' money, because we can't afford to have this major financial hit right in the middle of an election, because uh, uh, it just can't happen. So there is a possibility that the pressure that the IA people very cleverly put on will be reciprocated the other way. So that's possible. 
And it is getting more likely to me when I see what's going on in the negotiations. Now, understand, negotiations cover all kinds of issues, even when they're limited, as I said, by this early process. I know because I've been involved in a couple of them. And the, the obvious things you think about, if you know anything about unions or you've been in one or you've worked with one, are things like wages and pension benefits and health plans and all those big number issues. But there's lots of other things that come under the category of working conditions. The word from inside the negotiations that has been released based on the first week of negotiation is that they've made some pretty serious progress on working conditions. In particular, and I have to explain a little background here, but there's a thing in the movie business called turnaround time. And what it means is from the time we say, okay, that's a wrap for today, we'll see you tomorrow, you have to have a minimum number of hours to rest and recuperate before you have to be back. Turnaround time has been a real bone of contention, especially, by the way, for the Directors Guild, only because when everybody else goes home, the DGA is there for another hour afterwards doing all the paperwork and is there an hour early the next day waiting for people to show up so they can sign them in because the DGA is assistant directors, production managers, the people who you know, are the, the on-set HR department, if you will, for all these other crafts and services. So there have been cases where people, especially working on location someplace uh, outside of uh, their home, uh, are working 12 and 14 and 16 hour days, one after another. And there have been people die, folks, driving home because they fell asleep at the wheel. So this has been something that's been fought over for a long time and they got nowhere. All of a sudden, we are told that they have reached a tentative. Now, none of this is permanent because they haven't got the overall contract but they've gone to a 10-hour turnaround on all productions. That's a big deal because a lot of them have it, but a lot of them don't. The other thing they've gone to is about weekends, uh, about uh, having a a 54-hour turnaround on weekends. They've also supposedly reached a deal where the average uh, hour-long TV show is actually being filmed, not talking about pre- and post-production, for about seven or eight or nine days, and they're talking about writing in an extra day. So those are some pretty big concessions from the studios. They really are. And getting those out of the way up front is a way of saying, hey, guys, let's not all be so belligerent. We, we can get somewhere with this. Thing. Right. We, we can't afford another strike. Well, but. that's what that's that's why, you know, now when it comes to when the rubber hits the road, it's, yeah, okay, but those fewer hours and whatever, I have to get paid more to make up the income. And as I have stressed to people before, I don't know if you have a pension plan or how your pension plan works. Most of them are based on money. You have to make X amount of dollars to what they call vest in a pension plan or to qualify for a health plan. The Directors Guild is that way. The Writers Guild is that way. But the IA is not. The IA is entirely on the number of hours worked in a given quarter or year. Well, Back when people in the IA, the grips, the electricians, all of my buddies in the camera department and the sound department were all working on a 22 to 26 episode season, that meant we're almost there on the annual quota. We probably need a pilot or two or a couple of commercials to get there. But nowadays, how long is a season on all these streaming deals? Eight, 10 episodes? Right, now more I like miniseries. Two, now I need two or three. Well, but a miniseries might go on even longer because it's a bigger production. They, they need two or three of those at least. So the good news is we're going to have a longer turnaround. Therefore, you're not going to work as many hours, and therefore you're going to be more rested and more safe. The bad news is that's fewer hours towards the goal you're looking for to get qualified. So what's going to happen? I have no idea. Well, I've got- this thing is a is a Chinese box of complications um you know <laughs> and it's all well good. with uh, all kinds of of uh, uh of disagreeing or or shall we future. pro shall we let bogart explain it <laughs> go for it convince me that you know what this is all about that you aren't just fiddling around hoping it'll all come out right in the end <laughs> <laughs> perfect thank you humphrey now yes. mr ghost i've got i've got two questions for you that i i'm, I'm just very eager to hear your answers on these okay. let's circle back to moana for just a moment sure it seems to me that Disney is the one of the leading negotiators here, surely, that uh, if, if there is a strike, it only needs to go on for three, four, seven days, something like that, for Disney to pull the plug and say, well, we, we can't do Moana 2 now in time for November because this is on such an accelerated production schedule. So 
Um, so I, I so was, what you're suggesting is that maybe both of those scenarios I proposed are true, and they'll basically have one of these "Can I do it till I need glasses?" situations where hey, well, can we just kind of stall him for a week or two to kill our movie, and then we can go ahead and make a deal, Mr. Newsom? Well, hmm. I was particularly hmm. because I'm interested. After the big strikes of last year, I wonder if IA, for example, if their members, you know, if they don't go on strike, would they feel like they had been left out in terms of we didn't push as hard as the other the other unions? I don't know. I th there was a lot of feeling, like I say, three years ago in the previous contract that they got screwed and that they settled too easily. Uh, so that's hanging over this. That is why I believe the leadership came out so much in front of this thing. And they had a big rally in the San Fernando Valley and they made a lot of very, very, very strong, angry statements to kind of say, because you got to remember these, these guys that are the, uh, the b bosses of the union, they get elected by the rank and file. So there is a political situation within any guild that also exists. Uh, but well, that's why I wondered if there was internal pressure to get, you know, even if the strike lasts three, four, five days, there may be pressure from the members to say, listen, we were screwed last time. The other guilds are clearly uh, fighting far harder than our leadership. We want to strike, darn it. We want to strike, you know. And well, and, and you also have to remember that uh, they have a thing they call most favored nation status. The reason why the three contracts, the writers, the directors, and the IA happen in sequential years is so that everybody doesn't go out all at once. And But what they say is, if somebody gets better than you did, we get that too. For example, I got a notice from the Directors Guild, and I'm in both Directors and Writers Guild, uh, and also the, the Grips and a few other things. Um, they said uh, they got a few terms that we didn't have, so we're letting you know we have instantly made the arrangements with the, with the producers that we'll get those too. So everybody kind of leapfrogs on the back of everybody else in these things. Um, it's... It's good. And you also have to remember that if this happens again, look, if you work, when I first began working in the business, I was already doing things independently in a more creative way. I got into the grips union and I spent one summer, happy summer at universal moving walls and hanging lights and all that kind of stuff. And when I was there, I was excited. Oh boy, I'm finally in, you know? And I talked to the guys working with me and wondered what their aspirations were. And you'd be surprised how many of them said, well, this pays a lot better than framing houses in the Valley. So here I am. Right. Well, well what if it doesn't? Goodbye. Yeah. What if it doesn't? And what if this is their real job, but they all have a second job or their, their spouse does or whatever. What if a lot of these very, very experienced people say, you know what? This is more bother than it's worth. I think I'm done and don't come back. Uh, whenever everybody comes back, because a lot of them, I'm sure, were pushed to find other sources of income and of pension and health benefits while the other two strikes were going on. And potentially move. Potent so, and, and that's, look, let's go into the, th the next question then. So this is the other question I have for you. And this is, this is more, uh, what would you say? This is more esoteric, maybe. This is difficult for me to even sort of wrap the question into, but I, I'll hand it to you and, and you do what you okay. do so well. So a couple of, uh, maybe three data points here. So I'm looking at Kung Fu Panda 4, the, the latest DreamWorks uh, feature film that came out. And it it's doing so well. I mean, yeah. on an $85 million budget, it's going to have tremendous return on investment. That's wonderful for them. And it's particularly wonderful for them because they're getting ready to bring back and reboot the Shrek franchise. So all positives here. And yet, the reports are that DreamWorks is going to cut half yeah. of their staff yeah. and offload this overseas, okay? So that's point one. Point two is, we're going to be talking about, in the next couple of days, um, there's some indicators that Hollywood and Los Angeles are going into a financial depression, even, particular to that area. This has been reported by Deadline. We're going to be talking about it soon. So economic conditions, not great right now in SoCal. But the third data point that I want to give to you, this is something I'm paying very close attention to, and it has to do with the exodus of population that we're watching right now. Oh, yes. Oh, three yes. three major cities in the U.S. have had the most precipitous declines in population we've seen. New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and in no particular order there, um, those cities have lost something like a million people in population in the last two years, and it, it might be more than that. It seems to me 
that all of those data points point towards the work of making entertainment, the work of making fun for folks, that that is now being propagated and disseminated all over the world and out of Southern California. Well, and also to other states that have these tax programs. Because remember, there's an interesting little wrinkle. In the movie business, we have two kinds of rates. We have in-town rates and what we call distant location rates. And what that means is that if I take you from Hollywood to Nashville and put you on a movie there. I don't only have to pay you the normal scale I used to pay you. I also have to pay you first class or business transportation. I have to put you up in a hotel. I have to give you a per diem to feed yourself every day. And the rates are higher. And was that originally designed to keep the business well, of show business in California? I don't know about that, but it was certainly there to compensate people for the you know trial when there was nobody there. But now that there are people there, what the guilds and, and the studios got into was a problem. They would say to somebody on the sly, listen, I can't afford the distant location rates, but if you go there and rent an apartment and show up on the day, I'll hire you as a local instantly because I know you're good. I know you're more experienced maybe than some of the locals. And, well, and that's remember, what happens in Atlanta. Non-stop that's what happens in, all over. And what happens is, much, yes. but the local people who live there are saying, wait a minute, I pay dues to this union too. What, you're screwing me in favor of other members. And right. so here's the question. If these people relocate permanently, as many have in Atlanta uh, and, and a couple other places, uh, then suddenly they're locals where they are, and if there's enough work there, and if the work keeps moving there, uh, they moved right along with it, and goodbye, L.A., hello, uh, Georgia, or wherever. Yes. So to bring that back to Moana now, as we get ready to wrap up this conversation, Moana, the, the, the largesse of the work, apparently, has been moved to Vancouver now. You and I both suspect that there's plenty of work everywhere because you just can't make one of these things in six months. And you just can't do that with a with a studio that's never made a movie before. I mean, that's like trying to win the Super Bowl with and a team. It's, did they of, tell of us all there's, rookies? There's, there's 200 people there, and only 100 were there six months ago. So that means a lot of them are rookies. Yes, yes, or relocated. Well, um, yeah, from veteran teams. Yeah, but uh, I, I guess my question is, when it comes to animation, um, where are we at with? All of these, all of these ramifications of the strikes and negotiating these contracts, is animation the way that we're watching it now, where all of these jobs are now just going to other countries? Do you suspect that's also what's going to happen to entertainment more broadly? Because if Moana is cheaper and easier to produce with a brand new studio in a brand new place, is that what is that? what's coming for the rest of entertainment as well? Are we going to see more stuff coming out of Japan and South Korea, for example, and less and less coming out of the United States as studios say, we can't afford this anymore? Well, yeah, because they have to, you know, uh, when the whole wonderful world of digital and streaming and everything else happened, uh, I used to tell people at the guild, I had kind of a theme song. I'd say, you know, there's going to be five times as much work, but, none of it's going to be union and at your usual rates because they can't afford it. You have to remember when you used to make a TV show, it was CBS, NBC, ABC, that's it. So even the number three show that got canceled at the end of the season was getting a whole lot of people watching and buying soap. Now you've got 200 channels and nothing to watch, right? So the entire economics of I can make something for a niche market. I can make a show that only appeals to people interested in a certain subject, a home renovation or whatever it happens to be, but I can't get the same advertising revenue as when it was all Coke and Pepsi and big national international brands. Sure. So if I can't get the ad revenue and if I can't, and if I don't work as many days, it all rolls into a lot more work for a lot less money individually and a lot more people who are going to say, you know what? I can buy this program now and do it all myself. That's what, that's what uh, the guys, uh, Gore and Ng at, uh, at the, the D files were talking Film about was, was, that, yeah. was that all these people who their big dream was to go to Cal arts and work for Disney. Uh, they're telling them, do your own thing. You can make something that looks pretty damn professional without them. Who needs them and who needs the DEI and the pressure and all the rest of that, not to mention the cost and stress of living in L.A. Uh, we keep seeing stories about all these movie stars who are moving their families because they don't want to. I think the most recent uh, that I saw today was Ryan Gosling, 
who said, you know, I maybe can, but not in L.A. anymore. Thank you. That's right. And at the same time, I saw a story today that the LAPD has noticed what they're calling thievery tourism. Gangs from Chile and other places in South America come in on a tourist visa to L.A., get a fake certificate so they can open a bank account, steal things, put the money that they fence them right there into the bank account, and then transfer the money back home to Chile. I had not uh, heard of this. Oh, yeah. This was a big story this morning. I'll find the link and send it and to it, you. But it was all connected saying, with Chile? Yeah. Uh, Chile is not one said, of the countries I would typically associate with that. Well, sort of but you know, they're good capitalists with some of them and Hey, uh, yeah, yeah. everybody's but, but, got their bad eggs. But the thing is, who were they robbing from the people with the fancy houses in Beverly Hills? They said they stopped one out, one outfit, uh, the cops got them and they had over a million dollars worth of stuff from one house breaking alone. Well, I'm just impressed between jewels and designer stuff. <laughs> so all I'm saying is if the, if the, if the lifestyle, is worse and the expense of taxes are worse. I don't know if you saw, but California now wants to charge you based on your income, a surcharge on your utility bills. If you make over a certain amount of money, they're going to get an extra 150 bucks a month on your electric bill. Uh, well, all I can tell you is <laughs> at a I certain point, it ain't worth it is the point. I'm, I, I'll be six years out of LA on May 1st and I haven't looked back. I have watched and you've, I'm sure watched this as well shows and videos where they take folks from California and they show them what they could afford in other parts of the country and their minds are blown. You know, it's like these are these are average homes in the rest of the country, which are mansions. You know, you would well, call it an estate. And in, it's not uh, in, it's not just the houses, it's the cost of living and the utilities. There was there used to be a little program. I don't know if you've ever seen a website and it's fun. Anybody who wants to look at other places, it's called city-data.com. And you can look up any city in the country, big and small, and they tell you everything you ever wanted to know. Uh, famous people who were born there, number of radio stations, number of patent holders, all kinds of interesting stats. And they had a little program. You put in your zip code and your income, and the zip code of where you were thinking of moving to, and how much income there would buy you the same basic lifestyle for food and housing and utilities and, and fuel and all the rest of yes. it. Yes. And at that time, we had seen a house in um, Spring Hill, uh, Tennessee, that we really liked. And so I just picked a random number. I said, all right, what's the average you know, medium income? 75 grand. At that time, this is six or seven years ago, if you were making 75 grand in LA, you know how much you needed to make to have the exact same lifestyle in Tennessee? 24,000. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. 70, you're saying that if you made 75,000 in LA, yes, and you, you wanted could replicate the same that basic. With 24K. Yes, 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 got it. Yes. Well, so, I, do know that, I do know that Tennessee is one of the states that has the highest ratio of cost of living versus. Um, versus income or average income. In other words, folks, what you want to do if you're trying to find the best place to go is you want to find somewhere where the difference is the greatest uh, so that the average income is dramatically higher than the cost of living. So, well, And especially with taxes. You know, when I told friends in L.A. I was moving to Tennessee and that they had no state income tax, they looked at me with this shocked look and I said, yes, and they really do have police and fire and schools and roads. How do they do that? Well, they don't have a train to nowhere. Uh <laughs> well, that's, you know, Florida and Tennessee, uh, two of the highest population growth states in the past three years. We talked about the exodus that's happening from those big cities and neither Florida nor Tennessee have an income tax. So it's very lucrative for the wealthy to uh, join the party over in those states. Well, assuming but, uh, you can still generate the same amount of income there, of course, but to you give know, you an idea easier and easier with the internet, but, it's but, so but much let me give you the ultimate that. story yes, to, yes, to close please. out this part of the story. When we were getting ready to move, I read a story about a guy in San Jose, you know, suburb of, of Silicon Valley, you know, sure, it's sure. Bay area. And this is a guy who had made a good amount of money and had a nice home. And he also had four houses he owned that he rented to other people. That was his ongoing income after he retired from, I think, something cyber, you know, in Silicon Valley. Right. And when he decided he was going to move, and he moved not all the way here, or any, he moved to, I think it was Colorado Springs. But he went around to the four families that had been renting from him for years that he was friends with and said, guess what, guys, I'm leaving and I'm going to have to sell the houses. And when he told them the numbers, they all moved with him. 
<laughs> he, bought, he bought five houses in the new place instead of one and rented them to the same people. They all went with him when they saw the numbers. Well, so, that's, you know, <laughs> that is all definitely- I'm going back to our story, all of these guys in the IA, I mean, even, even within L.A., uh, my grips and my camera guys on the, on the shows that I did uh, all had their permanent homes way out in Palmdale, Lancaster. Uh, if you know the area, you'll know where that is. You could never commute every day to the studio from there. So what they did is they'd all get together and get a three or four bedroom apartment in town and share it. And that would be there during the week flop house. And then they'd go home to their families on Friday and come back Sunday night, Monday morning. Um, because it was just insane to live any place close. And that was, like I say, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years ago. Right. So and, and that's worse. why you have places like Atlanta that have exploded and, and you know, uh, they've exploded and, and folks are going there, you know, in droves to do these productions. And yet, so much and easier. yet Tyler Perry just canceled. What was it? $800 million worth of expansion right. to his studio because, Oh gee, if you can do it all on the computer. So look, uh, right. artificial of- intelligence, which is by the way, folks, that's what Disney and these other companies are having to look at when it comes to animation and Moana and, and Kung Fu Panda four and Shrek and uh, all of it. How much longer until you don't need animators because it's all being run through a completely different well, program, which is artificial intelligence. I, I think the the basic understanding of it, if you know traditional animation, from the beginning, Walt and everybody else had these people called in-betweeners, where the, the main artist would draw the keyframe and the getting right. from there to here was rid- done by somebody else. I am so impressed that you know the term keyframes. Oh, I talk oh. about this often. That was why I didn't like Wish, was because the keyframes were so obvious which let me know what a hurry the entire thing was in. Well, you know, I mean, obviously with Moana, we have to hope they can animate a seahorse. That's easier than a horse horse. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but all I'm of saying course, is the machine is now the ready. in-betweener. The machine is now the in-betweener. Uh, right, right. And, and to the degree that you take that attitude towards the creatives who draw the main things in the story, that's the degree to which you get wish. Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, folks. Uh, when we when we when we in the Directors Guild went on strike one time for all of I think it was three days because we got everything we wanted. Uh, one of our great uh, leaders made a speech and he said what these people at and he mentioned uh, Cap Cities and Sony and all the big in- uh, industrial companies that were buying movie studios, Gulf and Western. He said what they don't understand about this business as opposed to industrial businesses is in the movie business, the capital equipment goes home every night. <laughs> okay. That's a great. And great that's, point. that's, oh boy, is it? Uh, the guy that yes. wrote it was Lionel Chetwind. It was our, our pre- president, uh, um, uh, Gil Cates, who actually said the speech. But uh, I know that Lionel Chetwind wrote it for him. So I have to give credit where credit is due. But that's, that's the point. And if all of these very, very talented people, and if you don't think a grip or a dolly grip or an electrician or a gaffer can be vital, Try and make a movie someplace where they're not. Um, and I got nothing against England. It's a wonderful place. But I once did a show there, and it was shocking. Not just the lack of talent, because some of them had the talent, but the attitude. We were doing a show that went live to the world the next morning, and it gets to be 6 o'clock at night, and we're still wiring everything in the studio. And these guys, oh, well, tea break. Tea time. <sighs> and, then you, you know, but that's what they're used to. And so... You want these talented people to be there and also to pass their skills on to the next generation. And if you keep dissing them, they're going to say, thanks a lot, but uh, I think I'll do something else with my life. Well, one, one final anecdote. I, I have to say that when I was in the United Kingdom, uh, it, it, was a, it was a major realization to me that this whole tea time thing was real. Like <laughs> They really took the tea seriously. You know, I thought it was kind of a... Uh, Kind of a, a, a shtick at that point, you know. I thought, well, surely everybody here can't. Oh, yes, they they take tea time very, very well, seriously. Well, the di- the difference is we have, and it was one of the other things I didn't mention that they say they've reached an agreement on. We have what are called meal penalties in the business, which is if you don't break after a certain number of hours, you got to pay extra to keep going to encourage them to let people take a break and have a have a bite or whatever. Well, apparently they're increasing the meal penalties, um, in as part of what they've already agreed to. But again, none of these things that are agreed to are in stone until they make the whole contract because at some point they're going to say, well, we want X percent in the pension plan, and they're going to say, okay, but you've got to give up half of that mealtime thing that we had. And that's where negotiations happen. But you got to remember something that I learned very, very clearly. 
These studios, they don't like each other. And they are not negotiating together because they want to, but because they have to. Right. And they are quite willing uh, to cut the other one's throat if they can. <laughs> and it even gets more interesting. That's two within. birds, one stone, right? Well, Satisfy the union and example. get rid of one your competitor of, if you can. One of the years I was negotiating was right after NBC and Universal became one company. And you had the HR people from NBC and you had the HR people from Universal in there sitting across from you. And they both knew that one of them wasn't going to be there next time because they don't need two. <laughs> it was just too soon. Oh, boy, were they trying to score points with the boss who wasn't even in the room so they could say later, well, I got us this. Uh, these are human beings, folks, whether they're in the unions or in the management or anything in between. And human beings act like human beings. So know that when you read these stories that's right they're not monolithic unions and companies they're people as we've learned to our detriment about a certain guy who likes to take showers uh, <laughs> uh, well folks you came and, here for moana you came here and, and we delivered oh moana god promise. you got a co you got the studio tour we should have had a tram that's what i was <laughs> gonna say you got so much more and we're not going to charge you not a single penny we hope you enjoyed it you are now an expert when it comes to these areas one of my favorite conversations in quite a while. Lou, thank you so much for uh, giving us the tour of how things work. Oh, we you're very find welcome. Out. And we uh, find how they'll out. turn out, we don't know. But man, the, as Sherlock Holmes said, the game's afoot, you know? That's right. We'll find out. You know, it only takes about three days of a strike, I would suspect, for Disney to come out and say, oh, gosh, oh, gee, oh, darn. Can't do Moana 2 now. But uh. all those other films... They will probably be ready to go. It's a fascinating thing to watch. We'll continue to watch it. Folks, it's now your turn to participate in this endeavor. Click like, share, subscribe. Click it. Stick it to the algorithms. It's the notification bell. Drop a comment down below. Let us know your thoughts. And don't forget that the Pro Show is live tomorrow. That's Tuesday at noon Eastern time. Where Mr. Ghost will be rejoining us. As oh, we boy. Have. oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. That's right. We plan to have at least one panelist you've never seen before on the show, or at least not to any significant duration. You don't want to miss it. Folks, wherever you are and whatever you're doing, keep learning, keep growing, and as always, keep having fun. Ah, Floral, it's time for you to walk the plank. What? Why? Because you, you haven't subscribed to WDW Pro yet. Nor bookmark that parkplace.com on your web browser to get great articles from great contributors. What?